during graduate school. I call my friend Felix on a Friday evening. Felix, what are we going to do this weekend? See and be seen, as we do every weekend. <laughs> Felix, there's only so many times we can walk down Church Street, but if we can get to Penny Clues for brunch by 10 a.m., I'm in. <laughs> what you need to know about Felix is that he is over six feet tall, broad, Cuban opera singer. Me, not so much on the six feet tall. <laughs> so we were quite the, quite the sight walking down Church Street. We were often the only two people of color, and in our graduate school class, we were definitely the only two people of color. But being an only was not new to me. I'm an only child. I am, I was on my street growing up, the only girl on the street with a bunch of boys. Next door to me, Jay and Ben, three doors down, Doug. These were the people I played with. In school, I was the only Indian girl in class, but I was surrounded by a diversity of people in my class. For the talent show, my friend Becky, Becky had beautiful dark skin. She was the black strawberry shortcake. <laughs> my friend Patty, she was the Chinese blueberry muffin. And me, I was the Indian lemon meringue. <laughs> So this is how I grew up, in this connection between the only and community that continued through the weekend. On Saturday nights, our family would get ready, my mother would put on her sari, we would go to somebody's house, one of their family friends, and we would have dinner. All the kids in this gaggle of families would be in the basement, and the adults would be upstairs. The aunties. They were in the kitchen, making sure that we all had enough to eat, more than enough to eat. And the uncles, they were in the living room. They were talking about politics. They were talking about all sorts of things, multiple languages, Hindi, English, and then sometimes other Indian languages. Downstairs in the basement, we played Monopoly. We played all sorts of games, interrupted only to have dinner. And then at the end of the night, after what seemed like forever, but was really thin our cup chai, three more cups of tea, <laughs> the kids finally got to go home. And because I was the only one in the back seat, I could lay out and fall asleep <laughs> on the way home. <laughs> this tension between being the only and belonging continued in the summers. So there were several summers growing up that I would pack my little blue suitcase with the red and orange flowers full of coloring books and markers, puzzles, and anything else to make it through a long flight. There were no in-screen TVs right in front of your seat at that point. So this felt like the longest trip with an even longer layover. <laughs> The only good thing about the layover was that I pro was promised a gold triangular prism, a Toblerone bar. <laughs> and not just the little one that's this big, but the big one. <laughs> so that sustained me and then we got on another flight and finally when we deplaned and I could smell the musty, earthy smell, I knew that we had landed in the motherland. For the next three months, I would spend the summer with my family in India. Again, I'm the only, only child of my cousins. And I'm the only child who's growing up in the US. And on a school day, I was the only one who was home and didn't have to put on their uniform and get ready to go to school. When my cousins came home, I was no longer the only, we would run about, we would, I learned how to fly a kite. I also, when my, one of my oldest cousins would come, he would take us out on the street to have alukitiki jat from the street vendor. And it was served on these little bowls of pressed leaves and a little wooden spoon 
that I had only used before to have ice cream. And then at night, in the hot, hot Delhi summer, we would fall asleep, sometimes on the veranda, sometimes on the roof, surrounded by the smell of jasmine, queen of the night jasmine, which is really, really delightful, and the smell of the smoke coming from the coil to keep the mosquitoes away. <laughs> so this was my childhood, this tension between being the only and belonging, around being in multiple communities as an only and as part of that community. And in that tension, I found something else. When I got to high school, I was probably the only melanin-rich child in my class. <laughs> uh, for many, many classes, I found agency. And it looked like this. In senior humanities, when we were studying religious calendars of the world, we studied the liturgical calendar, we studied the Roman calendar and then we were done. So after class, I marched up to the teacher and I said, how come we're not studying the lunar calendar? Half of the world uses the lunar calendar. He was not amused. <laughs> this sense of agency carried with me into college. I was an orientation leader in college and one of the reasons I was so excited to be an orientation leader was to welcome new students into a new community. One night, the orientation leaders were off the clock, and one of the orientation leaders said to another, come here, little black girl, and make me laugh. And I thought, surely we're gonna address this in tomorrow morning's orientation leader meeting, because that is unacceptable. And we did address it. The person who ran orientation said, we under I understand there was an incident last night. Whatever has happened there, just let's not have it carry over into today. And I thought, I, I don't really think that that is how we want to do things. So I raised it with him. He didn't seem to want to do anything. I raised it with his supervisor. He didn't seem to want to do anything. And I realized that sometimes agency can also be lonely. So this tension between being the only and, being, and belonging has been with me ever since I was a child. It is also a place of my strength. And I want to ask all of you about what if, what if in that area between only and belonging, there is a way for us to find a deeper sense of empathy. And if that empathy can guide our agency, what would that look like? I think about this tension between only and belonging as a New Yorker, and I think there's something about this city that embraces that tension. And I will say when I moved to New York, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna use my agency for one other thing. I am gonna reclaim my name. When I was in school, the most dreaded part of the day was attendance. So we'd start at the A's and everything was good. And as we got closer and closer to the L's, I thought, oh, okay, he's going to get to the K. She's going to get to the K and there's going to be a pause. And it felt like the longest pause ever. Because I knew what was coming next was this. Sarabi? Yes, that's me. Okay, please, let's just get it over with and move on. I did not claim my name. But when I moved to New York, I decided there are so many people here from around the world, so many cultures, so many communities, they can say my name. <laughs> and maybe that's one of the reasons that I feel the least fractured in New York. So they can say my name, and for all of you, it's Surabhi. We can have lessons later. <laughs> um, and I think that there is something about New York and the tension between being the only and belonging. And it is from that tension that I gain most of my skills for doing the work that I do. I am in the business of the future of work. I am in the business of future of work in a number of ways. I am a teacher. 
I teach at NYU Wagner. I teach students about management. I teach students about workplace effectiveness. They are the future of work, and I hope that they will be in the workforce longer than I will. <laughs> As a career coach and career strategist, I work on people's individual futures of work. And I use those skills of navigating multiple communities in helping people understand what multiple jobs, multiple futures for them might look like. And I am a community builder. And I dig deep into that sense of belonging to build intentional community. So now I have some questions for you. How many of you have ever felt like an only? I want you to think about what it feels like to be an only. And I wonder if we dig, dig into that empathy, what our actions might look like. Our graduate school teacher used to start our classes with inviting us to consider haunting questions. And I have some haunting questions for you to consider. What does it feel like to not belong? What does it feel like to be invited? And what does it feel like when you are responsible for making somebody else feel left out? I believe that if we get into our empathy and use that as our point of agency, that we can make better communities, better conversations, and definitely better workplaces. I think all of us will be seen more, and we can create environments where other people are seen. And tonight, I see all of you. <laughs> I want to thank you for seeing me.